we um, take the start, please, and have a meeting. Um, I want to first, um, because uh, we, we've got names plates, the Commissioner's staff don't. Would, would you, Emily, like to introduce, or anyone, would the, would the Commissioner's staff like to introduce themselves? Well, I'm Clive Howell, I'm the Chief Executive of Working for the Commissioner. So I'm Councillor Emily Sporal, I'm the Deputy PCT. Okay, Councillor Jane Hayes, I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Okay, Morning, Tim Mills, I'm the Director of Commissioner for the PCC's Office. Thank you, okay. Um, item one is, uh, due to Emily's uh, elevation, uh, we have vacancy for the position of chairperson for the rest of this uh, municipal year. So, can I ask if there are any nominations for that post? Proposal well, seconded. Are there any other nominations? <coughs> in that case, Carla is elected unopposed to the position of chairperson, so she now takes over the, the chairmanship, the chairpersonship. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> Chair, the chairship. <laughs> chairship sounds awful, doesn't it? Yes. The chairing of the meeting. <laughs> That's it, yes. Uh, this year, uh, 
um, uh, and going forward, there's 18 million pounds of savings. Uh, these savings will be uh, used to offset that requirement.
I mean, the reality is we just don't have the officers that we had, you know, 10 years ago, and I think that's one of the ongoing challenges. Um, some of the work they're trying to do is to try and be accessible in a variety of different ways. Every, the community police station should have a time when they are open and accessible to the public. Um, we can go away and have a look at water because I don't know off the top of my head why they wouldn't be able to access that because there should be a time when it's open for people to come and speak to a police officer. So we can go away and look into that one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm not actually saying it's not open. Okay. It is open. I'm just saying people find it difficult to go there. Honestly, okay. the park in Morton is almost. Oh, I see. Way. Sorry, you mean. So, you know, so having it there right. seems really ridiculous to me. But, you know. Well, I mean, we're doing a review, so we can take that on board, can't we, when we look at um, how we review the community police station? So we can certainly take that on board um, and look at that as part of our review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the report lists quite properly the five priority areas, and the last one being the new one of uh, road safety. The rest of the report appears to pay little attention to that issue. And I wonder, first of all, what um, aspect, what impact um, we're likely to see as a result of trying to have this visible neighbourhood policing uh, in relation to road safety, um, because very clearly the area that I'm from has seen no improvement whatsoever and no presence whatsoever uh, following on this establishment of a priority. So it's not primarily associated and only associated with this item, but this is clearly about a visible um, policing. And, and does need to be, in my view, attended to if it's still to be maintained properly as a priority. Um, I think there's probably, um, there is a lot of work going on. I think the, the fifth strategy is still kind of being invented in terms of what that looks like. But um, last last week or a couple of weeks ago, we did an event in, where was that fire station again? Formby. Yeah, Formby. Um, in Formby, where um, we were, the police were there joining with the fire service, going out and talking to people about road safety priority, but having that visible presence, they were pulling people over if they weren't, um, giving cyclists enough of a, um, a distance to pass. So I think there is a way that we're trying to combine both in terms of being visible, talking to the public about this priority, um, but also being available if other people had other concerns to talk to us about. So I think it's still being worked out. There are a lot of examples of that where we're trying to get around the area to um, talk about road safety, but also make sure that we're visible and public as well. Because the report refers to forums, and, and in, in that sense, from ways of consulting. And, and I'm not aware in the area that I live, and nor are all the people that have spoken to in that area, of how on earth you would access that or be properly able to present your opinion either to the police or to the commissioner. I mean, I can do that, I'm maybe half in that sense. But, but, <laughs> they need the access as well. Okay. Just, yeah, if I may just have a decision on that. Obviously, um, one of the key triggers for, for the introduction of this priority was the fact that uh, a number of people who have killed and so seriously injured in Merseyside is way above the mass of uh, Clearly, nobody would say that we will do nothing about the So I think it's quite right to introduce that as a priority. What we've noticed uh, since the introduction of it is the challenge that the Commission has given to Mercy Cyclists to see more enforcement activity and we've begun to see a reduction in the killed and seriously injured numbers in Merseyside. Not a massive reduction, but clearly it's having an impact which, you know, as we all know in terms of enforcement, has an effect. There are other things around road safety that can be done, you know, with the primary duties of the Mercy Cyclists and the service for me is to enforce the law. So we are seeing some impact. It may be that there isn't a hot spot in your area in terms of killed and seriously injured statistics. I talk be all and end all. But to have maximum impact for the initial resources, that's where the, the priority in terms of deployment would sit with the satellites. I think I go back to the point I made to the Commissioner, and she was talking about establishing this as a priority. Two points. One is, if you're establishing it as a priority, you have to put sufficient resources in for it to be seen as being implemented as a priority. And secondly, it may be about deaths on the road. But the 
people who live in the areas are just as concerned about double park, double yellow line parking, schools and access, etc., etc. <coughs> and it's that area that people are also saying, well, if they're doing anything, let's see them doing something about this. Now, I accept, and I'm, I'm a realist, it can't happen overnight. The simple fact is that people are unaware of what potentially could happen and may be happening, and, and increasing the opportunities that people have to make known <coughs> that and see that things are happening is crucial. Presumably, is that they the way that they used is that there's maybe uh, uh, one occasion there might be a you know tu every Tuesday afternoon there's a drop-in session. In addition, uh, oh, there's a problem. Why don't you come along to the community police station? Should we say three o'clock on Friday? And you know, only be neighbours. It's that sort of thing. It's sort of uh, used. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not. It, it's it, the obvious thing is it's not man uh, you know, on a significant. Basis, it's, it's, a, it's, it's there as a facility to use. Uh, it just occurs to me that, in terms of the key priority of the, um, I get it right, uh, visible and accessible neighbourhood policing style, that there could be a danger the public, if you like, and even the 40% is 40% of the days, so it's not the whole day, it might be just that Tuesday afternoon. So, Tuesday morning, it's not even used. People wander past and they think, my goodness. There's never any, you know, this, this place is shut up most of the time. Well, it is, 60% of the time it's not used. And maybe more than that because it's only part days or whatever. So I think there's an important communication issue there to explain that this is not an old-fashioned police station. With the, the, the police force is moving to, as I understand it, a different thing. The hub, which I always call a sort of back office thing, and that, I say, that can be on a fringe of town trading estate because one of the main things is you've got car parking space for, for officers own vehicles and staff, and also police vehicles. It doesn't matter where it is, because that's not for the public. And you have these, these towers and, and, and inquiry offices in limited places. But it's, it's, it's important that the public understand that, or the danger is that the strategy actually feeds a feeling 
there's a, there's a ever diminishing yeah. accessible policing staff. Would you yeah. tell that more, Emily? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you raise a very good point, and it's a, it's a point that I was the first I made to the commissioner when I joined her, um, because I think we need to make sure that people understand when they can come to the police, what the purpose of the stations are, just so that we'll provide that service. So, yeah, absolutely, we've already had those conversations. And I think that review of the stations that the force are really looking at, I think, will give us an opportunity to look at that communication element as well. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, can I, sorry, can I just come, I mean, when, when for, on, on the world, Paul Harrison is doing a good job in regard to um, uh, sort of um, scrambler bikes and that. It did come on the council, was, um, and that, but he did send me an email to say that over the last three weeks, um, we see something like 25, you know, because of anti-social behaviour. What concerns me though, there's a huge focus on that, and rightly so, because there's huge problems, for example, in Morton, There's a huge focus on that, and then other sort of priorities seem to be left, you know, because everyone is going there to do this because it's been brought up at full council, and mm -hmm. um, everyone is talking about it, and then um, some other issues that come up, then, oh well, we're very busy because we're doing this. Admirable and all that. So it almost suggests to me that you have to just pick on something that's causing a lot of problems to people, but other things are just left behind. I'm just concerned about that. Um, I don't think that certainly the message that's going through to the forefront, I think, from the Commission perspective, is that we're not expecting other things to be left behind. I think the Commission has identified scramble bikes, rightly so, because I think the community had identified that as a, as a massive issue across Merseyside. So I think she had asked the force to pay special attention to it. But that doesn't mean that other issues should just be getting left and ignored. Um, there will always be this balance of resources, as you will have heard before. Um, trying to kind of get resources in the right places is going to be another, uh, another a challenge, I think. But there's no reason why things should be completely getting dropped off. Again, as Clive said before, if you have concerns about that, you speak to the local inspector or get in touch with us and we can find out if something's not quite being tackled because the force should be able to kind of look at all issues as much as they can. Yeah, just, just in addition to that as well, obviously the Happy Say process that has been reviewed by Major Cyclists at the moment mm -hmm. is key in terms of the community taking part in the priority setting process. However, I guess the local uh, police command team have a tough call to make in relation to threat risk and harm and if there's a situation that is likely to cause more harm to members of the community then that I think should automatically become a priority but it certainly doesn't mean that things are forgotten about or left behind uh, but as the deputy says in terms of finite resources it's often difficult to, to achieve that balance um, I'm sure that frustration has been fed back to all local policing teams and Thank you for your response. Um, are the panel satisfied with the progress being made to deliver the police plan priority? You're asking? Yes. Yeah. Um, I suggest that we are, yes. Yeah. previously around um, how the PCC holds the Chief Constable to account. So shortly after um, the PCC in 2012, um, she signed off a scrutiny decision-making framework, uh, which is included in your paper as Appendix 1, um, and this basically outlines the way that um, she holds the Chief Constable to account. And there's six kind of broad mechanisms. Um, the first is regular one board meetings with the Chief Constable. Um, again, you've got some information about that in your Appendix 2 um, on some of the meetings that have been held so far. Um, there is the PCC Performance and Scrutiny Group meetings, um, and these are held quarterly. Um, they're a public meeting, and I believe a couple of the panel members attended the last one. Um, and obviously, any panel members are very welcome to attend any future meetings. And you've got an example, um, quite a long example, so apologies for all the paper. Um, but it gives you an idea of some of the data um, that is discussed to see how the course is uh, performing. Uh, third is the Business Change Programme. Um, so it's these meetings where um, the PCC and the force will talk about the Community First programme um, and how that's progressing. Um, the key decisions, so you'll be aware that the PCC publishes the key decisions um, and a number of these will be from the force, so that process of um, the PCC signing off key decisions by the force um, is the other process. Um, and then there's the internal and external audit processes and then also the um, inside community safety partnership. So again, happy to take any questions. 
with some of the other type of services. So generally, it just depends on, on the service. Satisfied with the outcome and impact of the Commission's service, services, including the Commissioner's side of the initiatives during 2016 and So, just one question for later. I've asked it before, um, and the Commissioner did indicate some possible uh, movement in that direction. The witness service provided in courts, currently provided by CAB or the contract. Uh, and there was an indication that that may be moving towards the PCC's office. And I'm just wondering whether there's any information about progress or otherwise. So, Joe, I'm going to update on that in the next presentation, but I'll put on briefly. Um, it is still potentially going to be devolved out from the National um, CAB service, potentially out to PCC's. Um, they had originally intended to, uh, to do that from, from April next year, um, but now we're being told that it's likely to be pushed back probably till at least April 19. Yeah, I understood the CAB has got an extension, so yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're still on track for that. Exactly. We are, but um, we are waiting for guidance from the Ministry of Justice to tell us when that's going to happen or even if it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just make a comment? I'm pleased to see that um, money's been put into um, the drama group in Children in Wirral because they did that fantastic reduction on one condition. And uh, I think it was really important that uh, people like foster carers and people were invited to attend that. Very, very powerful. Everybody has seen it or not. It was certainly worth attending. I and mean, there is a list of people that have seen it. So I think I'm going to go into Nick now to talk you through where we're up to with the uh, current commissioning process. I'm sorry, I'm not great with IT and I'm not sure how to work this, so I might just have to possibly move that laptop a little bit because I don't want to stand in your way. Um, Victims of crime for the last few months. 
uh, answer give you an idea, most important for you, with the commission timeline, to make, we'll make sure that we've got our new commission services in place for April. Okay, so this is the, not so yet, but this is the Vitamin Assessment Jigsaw. The Jigsaw is all about identifying what is missing, missing for victims of crime across the region, to make sure that the services that we uh, develop meet their needs, but also link into what service providers can provide, and also how we um, join those services up with our, with our statutory partners across the area. So the Jigsaw is all about um, identifying um, what is the problem, what our problem profile and work, and I'll touch a little bit more on this later in the presentation. Um, service mapping, really important that we know who's actually delivering services out on the side footprints. It's pointless trying to commission the service nobody, that nobody can deliver. Our evidence reviews, so looking across the national and local picture and what works well uh, so that we can build that into our service specifications. Um, and really, really importantly, speaking to victims about what they need from us and speaking to service providers about what they can provide and also what they think is actually missing from that footprint. And very importantly, obviously, we need to speak to our strategic partners to tell them what we're doing so that they're comfortable with what we're delivering. So, um, probably, I know you just had a little bit of a flavour about what services are being delivered currently across the footprints, but it's important to tell you about them because <coughs> everything that we do now with fits in these assessments, um, if it tells us that we need a new service, will affect the services that we are currently delivering. To deliver our services, just to remind you where we get our funding from, um, BCC has got a number of funding streams, but the most important one that we're concentrating on today is the Ministry of Justice funding uh, that is primarily focused upon um, victim needs, allowing victims to cope and recover from their victimisation experience. Um, this year, from 17 through to 18, the PCC received £1.638 million, um, and that has um, allowed us to provide those services across the Ministry side. Um, over the lifetime of the last three years, the fund has not changed a great deal. Um, I think we lost five. John, tell me better. Uh, I think we lost five thousand pounds this year compared to last year. Um, but certainly, our service provider costs are going up, and um, so you know it hasn't allowed us to expand our service in terms of costs over that time. I'll give you a bit more detail of this in a second, but that's generally a breakdown of how much we pay our service providers. Interestingly, the top line is um, how much we actually get from the from MOJ, £1.638 million, pounds, and the bottom line is the amount we committed to funding from the 1st of April 2017 through to 18, which is £1.592 million, pounds. so very little leeway uh, in the amount of um, funding we've got available after we've commissioned from April onwards. Uh, so it just re-emphasises that point that if we develop a new service, we've got to change something else that we are currently delivering. So just again to touch on the services that we're delivering at the moment. I know you've had some of this, but you didn't have the costs. So um, the child exploitation service is a service that's changed somewhat over the last three years. For the first two years, it was a, simply a child sexual exploitation service, but the commissioner recognised the growing trend of, you've probably heard of it, county lines, but child, child criminal exploitation issues. And so we combined that service into one for this last of the three year of the strategy. Delivered by Catch-22, who have um, staff working in every local authority area, uh, and that cost of that service is just over £180,000. Um, vulnerable Victim Service that uh, the Deputy PCC spoke about before is delivered by Victim Support. They're a kind of service that, if, if there's not a specialist service for somebody to be referred to, they will be referred to.